me see if I can get it working. They are opening the gates to hell here. And I'm telling you, Parsons, he's at the center of it. You're almost here. What did you do? Um, awesome. yeah, first off, uh, thanks. Thanks so much for taking the time to, you know, speak with horror DNA about your new film, the breach. Um, uh, would you, you uh, would that maybe tell us how the film came to be? Was it something that was pitched to you or was this something you kind of had your eye on for a while? Was it maybe a little more of a dream project kind of thing. Well, what, what happened was, um, this was right in the middle of the pandemic, uh, 2020, um, you know those good times and like everybody else in the world i was uh i was uh at home really just kind of staring at the four walls i mean i was doing stuff but you know i was i was it was locked down all over the whole you know uh, and then i got a call from uh, mike pash from raven banner just said hey we have this script we want to be the first people to kind of be shooting um you know in times of pandemic and um are you uh are you oh just a moment oh hey okay go down the stairs i'll be right with you <laughs> sorry that's my it's my little boy he just walked in um, <laughs> anyway so uh where was that yeah so they you know they they just kind of uh you know mike was like hey read this and tell me what you think and we want to be the first you know one of the first productions to be shooting um, and you know, my first, my first thought was like, oh, please, I hope this doesn't, the script doesn't suck. Cause I'd love to obviously be shooting a movie, you know, that sure, nothing's yeah. happening in the world I'd like to do. Um, and so luckily, um, it didn't. And, um, you know, the, the uh, Raven Banner and, and, uh, the writers, Ian Weir and, um, Nick Cutter, um, you know, they were open to me making some changes and stuff. So, um, so yeah, you know, about, basically I had about a month to, to do some changes and then away we, away we went. So it's a very quick process. And I, I actually, you know, I didn't even know it was based on a book or that there was a book because the book hadn't been published at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe when I received the script, it was called Gone Up River and it was, the book was called Gone Up River, I believe that the book that was being worked on. And then I kind of made these changes, I added some Lovecraft stuff and, and called it The Breach. And then um, later on, about a year later, I found out that the book was called The Breach. So I think there was a bit of a cross pollination, you know, from book to screen and vice versa. Yeah, I see, definitely. Yeah, I've not read the Nick Cutter novel. I do have it on my Audible now because it's been highly recommended to me by a ton of people, but like, was it a lot of changes you had to make to the source material or just kind of little tweaks here and there? Um, it, uh, that's a good question. I gotta, I mean, the, 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 the script was there, you know, the, the characters, I, like I changed some characters. I remember I changed like genders of characters. I changed dynamics of the characters. I changed like, okay. uh, th things that were like, between the characters in the movie, I believe with the script that I received, um, um, there it was it was uh, the police chief, and then the the girl that he had been involved with, and then it was her uncle. Mm -hmm. So I, I changed the uncle to a previous level. I mean, you know, he was the mort mortician and stuff. So I, I kind of added some some dramatic elements, and then I do, if I remember correctly, the script had a lot to do with um, people sort of turning into bugs. So it was very much about a bug mm. thing. But I kind of uh, sort of changed that, took it out of the bugs and kind of <clears throat> put it into more like this Lovecraftian territory where this sort of entity was trying to get into our world and it was affecting people physically, right? And, you know, it was tied to the machine. I believe in the original was, there was obviously the machine played a big part in that. So I kind of just made these changes. Um, 
Yeah, it's a bunch of them. A whole bunch, yep. Well, I I just saw it and reviewed it recently. I don't think my review was actually hit on the internet yet, but I uh, in my review, I gushed pretty hard <laughs> over the oh, way. It's that's kind awesome. of a, I felt like it was almost two films in one, in a way. Like, the first couple acts really felt like an 80s-style sort of investigative thriller had that sort of the pacing reminded me of Manhunter a lot very inevitable in that way and then you know the final act was the cosmic horror and the body horror mashup were there any films that were influencing you on this one as far as just a look Uh, or a style yeah I'm happy to hear you say Manhunter that's a real that's an old favorite you know people you know let's talk about oh it's great I mean people obviously talk about Science of the Lambs and Hannibal Manhunter gets kind of um swept under the rug a little bit um so i'm happy to 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 hear you make that connection yeah i mean with this one um you know there wasn't any um specific uh film influences i think because because the entire thing was it was very uh you know we were kind of flying by the seat of our pants it was really hitting the ground running it was literally like you're gonna shoot this in a month or six weeks or something so it was very um it was very much like okay, go go go, and and um, but you know, uh, the, the truth of the matter is when 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 I'm on set, you're you're kind of drawing from all of these things, it's sort of like unconsciously. So you know, when I when I saw the finished product, it's oh, there's a little bit of alien there, and there's a little bit of you know, um, uh, you know, some whatever haunted house thing there, some of the Amityville there, little, little bits and pieces that, you know, that kind of come to the form. So like when you're on, you know, when you're trying to try to uh, sort of like tackle a scene and then you're like, Oh, I remember that scene from this movie and it would, maybe we could kind of do it that way. Um, yeah. But it, it was really kind of like on the fly. So um, yeah. Yeah. I thought I had a pretty, like the Manhunter thing really struck me that that final act felt very from beyond, which is a pretty high compliment. You know, there's obviously a lot of similarities yeah, there, but the style is definitely in that vein. Um, it really shines from an art direction and a set design standpoint. Really, really stood out to me. How impressed were you with the house and the lab and everything that they made you? That was that was pretty badass. It was, thank you. Yeah, it was great. Well, here's what happened. Um, Stuart, it was really interesting because this movie was shot, as I say, during the pandemic. And my my first thought was like, oh, the whole world's empty. We're going to have like access to everything. But in fact, the opposite was true. (laughs) You couldn't shoot in parks. You couldn't shoot in any public places. You couldn't do anything. So so what ended up happening is um, the production ended up renting a hotel. And almost the entire movie was shot at this hotel. So that when you go inside the house, that's actually the ballroom. It was, you know, the attic was created in the ballroom. The house, the interior of the house was created in the ballroom. Oh, wow. Um, the, the upstairs of the house was sort of like a dilapidated uh, uh, bunch of rooms that they had on the ground. The front of the house was literally just a... Um, like a porch that they made. If I, if I move the camera to the left, you would see a barn. If I moved it to the right, you would see the hotel. Like yeah. it, it was, it was really tight. You know what I mean? So it, it was all <clears throat> kind of a lot of, a lot of like smoke and mirror cinematic stuff to get it to look that way. So I'm <laughs> very happy to hear you, you say that it, it was really uh, um, just really, you know, we use, I think we turned the kitchen into the mortuary. We, kind of did all kinds of stuff like that and and um yeah we just try to you know we, we just found places that worked so but yeah i mean look the the the, the art department was stellar um they really just put this thing together i mean when i look through the lens i'm like i'm at this place you know it feels like it's isolated it feels like definitely, it's out definitely. in the middle of nowhere you know <clears throat> but um there's a lot of creative stuff going on on the day let me tell you <laughs> a lot of that good movie magic. Well, it, it, it definitely works. Um, can you tell us, how, how exactly did you hook up with Daniel Baker and Chris Cooper? Their work, I, I admittedly, names I hadn't really heard of before I saw this. And I want to see everything they do from here on. Their, their awesome. sex work was fantastic. 
I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that too. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, they, I mean, look, they, the, those guys delivered in spades. Um, they, uh, they, I think it was um, partly actually, again, due to the pandemic, because a lot of people, you know, people weren't working. Yeah. So I kind of had the bit of a pick, the, pick of the litter. Um, and, uh, the, you know, uh, Daniel, I worked very close with him um, to come up with all, I mean, he just, you know, I would give him an idea and I would talk it through and then he, he would show up with these incredible busts and casts and stuff. I mean, it was yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. And, I, and, and for me, it was really important to, to have that kind of, yeah, it was like an 80s horror feel to it, in-camera effects, old school effects. Well, um, and, you know, one of the reasons to what, yeah, practical, I, you know, one of the reasons too, I thought, you know, I believe in the script we had the, I think it was an all nighter, but I thought, you know, we should do, we should get into the daytime and bring these creatures out at the daytime, you know, and just kind of mm -hmm. like get it really, you know, just, just add a different tone to this movie and, and really kind of like, um, uh, you know, give give the audience uh, the the groceries, as it were. But you know, like get them to get a good look at all these creatures and stuff. They but they, they were just so beautiful, and they put such so much work into them. So I'm glad I'm glad you dug it. Yeah, definitely names I'm not gonna forget anytime soon. Even though I hadn't heard of them before, they were amazing. So that's a good excellent. Call. Yeah. For a, you know, for a movie that really kind of loses its mind in the last act, I mean that in the best way possible. But for a movie that's, that's <laughs> yeah. so starkly one thing in the first two acts and it's something different in the, the final act, I thought it was really restrained, if you will, and kind of patient throughout in terms of the character building and the setup and everything. How important do you feel it is to let the audience's mind fill in the blanks? Hugely, hugely important. If you've ever seen any of my other movies, that I kind of err on the side of letting people do that. I think that's kind of like um, really the magic of cinema where people can participate. Um, if you, I think it's important that you don't, <clears throat> as a director or as a filmmaker, you don't <clears throat> tell people necessarily where to look even in the frame, where you don't make mm -hmm. it obvious and you let them explore the frame and you let them kind of check out the background lose, yeah yeah and, and kind of like lose themselves in the movie a bit and kind of you know um so so it's really important to me i i you know when i watch some of these uh, sort of more uh blockbuster films or whatever where where everything is you know what center frame i get i get really bored because my imagination doesn't kick in you know mm -hmm. um so um i think that's what when people's always say, you know, that the book is always better than the movie or things like that because their imaginations work. They're, they're contributing so much to the story. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, uh, and um, with, with the film, it's obviously less so, but it's, it's, I think it's really important to, uh, to keep that in there, keep that in the balance because otherwise, you know, if people aren't participating imaginatively with your work of art, then what's happening? They're just, it's just a commercial, really. Very true. Very true. It's like that old thing, joke about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. How everybody thinks it's a much more graphic and violent film than it is, but right. their brains are actually filling in a lot of the spaces and making it look so, so nasty. Yeah, that's, that's an important step. Absolutely, yeah. It, yeah, also, like, uh, you know, Alfred Hitchcock was a master of that. You know, there's so many people would swear that they saw the knife go in and Janet Lee when in, during the shower sequence. But yeah. there is no, you know, it's just all sound design and the juxtaposition of these images. I mean, you know, you see you see what you think you saw, right? So Yeah, touche. Even better examples. <laughs> there you go. So as our um, viewers may or may not know, of course, you're the founder of Room Warp Magazine. Uh, it kind of goes without saying you've seen a lot of horror <laughs> in your time yeah. now. Since the uh, late yeah. 90s, I think it was like, what, 97 when you founded the magazine? Um, yeah. In this crop of people we got going now, who are a couple of your favorite kind of up-and-coming directors that maybe a lot of people haven't really heard about yet? <laughs> Well, I do like the Adams family, not the Adams family, um, you know, the Adams family, you know, but the Adams, um, there's a, an actual family, I believe it's two daughters and mother and father. 
Yeah. They're making movies independently, <clears throat> like out of their house. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they made a, a, a film during the pandemic called Hellbender. Hellbenders or Hellbender? Um, oh, okay. Really I reviewed that film. Yeah. yeah, I know what yeah. you're talking about. Definitely. It's a good film. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was really great. So I really yeah. think that they're poised to do some really interesting stuff. Uh, for sure. I, I was... Uh, uh, yeah, just kind of how they put that together. I thought that was really, really fantastic. <clears throat> um, you're probably meaning more independent people. And um, it's that other, oh, geez, I'm, I'm, uh, you put me on the spot a little bit here. But uh, <laughs> um, uh, what's his name? Um, he did the Harbinger. Actually, we put that on the cover of Mark, I believe. Um, Andy Mitten, I want to say, New York guy. Okay, uh, okay. He's d done a lot of done a lot of movies. Um, interesting filmmaker for sure. Very interesting filmmaker. Um, you know, he's obviously um, very very devoted to the genre and has you know slowly building up his uh, <clears throat> his uh, repertoire of, of movies. I think he's he's going to be doing some. Um, it's just a, a guy to keep an eye on for sure, just to see what. He what he's very doing. cool. So very, very, cool. very interesting. Yeah. 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 In 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 prepping for the interview, I mean, I I read through more to like everybody else, but I didn't actually realize how many different forms of media you guys have your hands in between films, the music albums, podcasts, radio, conventions. Um, outside of the films, obviously, which is a big focus for you from the magazine side and everything, mm -hmm. is there any one of those, like, what's your kind of pet project right now outside of the films on the Rue Morgue side of things? Like, what are you really getting into right now? Well, I do like the, um, like, overseeing the entire brand is what's interesting to me, you know, and sort of, and, okay. and sort of like, the, and, and kind of directing it a little, you know, it's kind of that's what I do. So I'll, I'll direct the movie, but in a way, what, what I do with Morgan is directed as well. So I work with Andrea very closely with the magazine. I work with the, uh, on the Rumor TV side as well, with the team there. There's, uh, <clears throat> you know, the various screenings and expo that we have. Actually, the expo have taken a bit of a, Oh, of a, a step back from that. Um, I didn't enjoy that as much, but uh, you know, it's still, it's, it's obviously an important thing that we do. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, it's just kind of like managing from the top and just making sure that um, we're going in the right direction and uh, yeah, that it's, uh, that it's exploring the avenues that, uh, that it needs to explore, right? That, yeah, and it stays current and it stays fresh, and there's new blood and there's fresh blood, and you know that kind of thing. And nice and diversified. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice and diversified, and yeah, for sure. It's not, you know, it's not easy. It, it's not. Um, maybe when I started Rumorg back in you know 25 years ago, I thought, oh yeah, maybe you just sort of start it and then it'll just kind of go on its own. But it, in fact, it's it's never really been the case. You know, so it's kind kind of like always check and see if things are at an optimum working optimum optimally yes okay outstanding <laughs> like a car you know you have to keep checking it <laughs> yeah you gotta, gotta gotta do the maintenance that's for sure yeah, yeah make but... sure it's going in the right direction <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I do come to one of the inevitable questions, but not exactly the way everybody else would do it. I have heard what your favorite movie is, but I like to ask personally, not your favorite movie so much as if you had a Mount Rushmore of four particular films, which are the ones that influence you the most? Don't have to be horror, just oh. the four films for yeah. you that like make up your sort of style and yeah. headspace, you know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's an easy, that's an easy uh, answer because it, back when I was, um, I would say around 18, between the time I was around 17 and 19, somewhere in there, mm -hmm. I used to watch uh, four films religiously, like sort of over and over. Okay. <clears throat> Just kind of over and over. Uh, those films were The Shining by Stanley Kubrick, um, Blue Velvet by David Lynch. Fuck yeah. All right. 
Scarface by um, uh, what's his name now? Why am I forgetting his name? Um, Brian De Palma. Yeah, De Palma. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Godfather. So I kind of cheated because there were three of them. Uh, but I, I would, I would just, uh, well, at that time there were only two actually. I think the third one came later. But um, um, I would just watch these movies over and over. Yeah. Um, yeah, like you know, on the weekends I would watch the movies. I mean, you know, back then uh, too, the you know, home video was a huge thing still. And so a friend and I, you know, we would obviously go in there and we just take all the horror movies we could. We could we watch garbage horror movies, watch the best, you know. But we discovered <laughs> just all swipe kinds the of shelf stuff. Into the cart, yeah. Oh, absolutely! And then just watched. We just committed to it. Like even the stuff was trash. We would just be like, yeah, let's get through this. And uh, and of course, we ended up discovering some great stuff and you know I, I mean i knew romero's movies but i didn't know i'd never seen day of the dead uncut or anything like that i'd never seen you know yeah um and so you know some of his other stuff all, all of carpenter stuff obviously uh you know just just uh getting really into all the all the classic genre stuff um so um you know, but in between that, you know, on weekends, it, it would be like, okay, let's throw on Blue Velvet for like the 40th time. And, you know, it, it was like, um, even, I saw Blue Velvet about maybe, I don't know, I want to say four years ago or something, five years ago. And oh, I couldn't, I, yeah, like I couldn't see it with a clear eye. I, I'd just seen it so many times that when I saw it, I was remembering how I was when I was like 18 and 19 years old. Sure. So it, it was like a, t you know, and the same thing with, um, with the shining to a lesser extent, um, because I saw the shining more times over, over the years and Scarface as well. Um, but yeah, so it was, um, it was a really exciting time, you know, early those early years you know you you kind of feel like you can do anything and you feel like ah oh, you know like maybe i'll be a filmmaker maybe i'll try and what kind of movies do i want to make and you know there's like that innocence of of uh coming into it so fresh i think you know room warm taught me a lot about the genre but also um uh once you see a lot of horror movies too you kind of you you know there's a tipping point where I think it's it can it can be not in your favor as a creator. I would say mm -hmm. put it that way. It's a good it's way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. It's not as constructive. And you might be sort of limiting yourself and going, "Oh, this is what the genre is about," and I'll stick to that. Um, so yeah, at some point, I deliberately uh, what I would do is I would just kind of like ask the staff all the time, "Hey, what what's the great movie that came out?" And I would only watch the great ones, <laughs> at least. <laughs> what they told me was great, um, you know, and I would just kind of avoid all the other ones. Um, there's another filmmaker I want to tell you about. His name yeah, sure, is yeah. um, Damien Rugna. He's from Argentina. He did a movie called um, Aterrados, which means, and I think they, they, they translated in English as terrified not terrifier yes terrified oh terrified i'm picturing the cover in my head it's got the yeah freaky looking uh, like corpse looking thing on the cover yes that, uh, i did actually watch that movie that was the um, it had that really horrible bathtub scene in it if i'm if that's the one yeah. i'm thinking of yes yeah, the, that movie the, is the girl is smashing yes yeah, yes yeah, 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 yeah. that movie is that utterly was, screwed I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think that guy for sure. He's definitely uh, another person to keep an eye on for sure. Awesome, right on. Well, you got the two features so far. I'd say you're batting a thousand between Rosalind Lee and The Breach, both excellent films. Oh, so, as a filmmaker, you. you know you've always got a lot of uh, irons in the fire, so to speak. So I guess the inevitable last question is which uh, which iron's the hottest right now for you? What are you doing next? Uh, well, I have this new company with uh, with uh, Slash and some of the Raven Banner guys. Uh, it's called B 
Berserker Gang we just launched. And um, so there's a bunch of stuff in there. Um, that's me going to be uh, well, doing more production, sort of, sort of like producing rather. Um, and me as a creator, as a, as a filmmaker, there I have this Spanish language horror film, which I would say is the hottest uh, iron in the fire right now. Oh, okay. um, I can't tell you too much about it, but it's very sprawling, very, um, it's sort of like, it's a police procedural with a lot of creatures and it's in Spanish. Um, I think, I think it's, uh, it's quite scary. I think I want to make it Ooh. scary. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so that's what I'm working on. Uh, there's a couple of other projects, but that one is definitely, uh, something I hope to and you've been yeah. able to work with Slash. That had to be uh, one of the coolest things ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I met Slash back in 2013, I think it was. So I had just released Rosalind Lee, and he had released his movie, which was called um, Nothing Left to Fear. So um, I had a, a, a big expo in Toronto called the Festival of Fear, and he was coming up to... Um, to um to promote the movie so we ended up meeting and you know he, he was a big room work fan and, and stuff so so that was really cool and you know we we ended up hitting it off and, and i was working on a horror western at the time he really liked the script a lot so he you know he tried to help me get it made um there was a bunch of people trying to help me get it made including mads mickelson and some other people Oh. But uh, yeah, but that movie unfortunately didn't didn't gel. It came very very close to happening, and it you know several times, and it just didn't. You know, it's one of those things that happens in the music biz where you, you <laughs> work so long on a movie and it doesn't happen, and then, and then you get like something like the breach, and it's just like oh yeah, in two months you're just shooting or whatever. <laughs> um, so, um, but anyway, I mean, it, it hasn't happened yet. I'm gonna say. Um, but, uh, so it was really cool that, you know, what, once, uh, sort of the breach came, you know, uh, fell on my lap and, uh, reached out to him. He was like, yeah, let, let me look at the script and he dug it and he had time to do some music for it, even though he was like rehearsing for this enormous, uh, Guns N' Roses, uh, world tour, you know? Yeah. Um, so it, it was, it was super cool, man. It was like, you know, it was really great working with him and, uh, and he, he was just really open to to the back and forth and stuff and, and you know just getting it right so it was really cool very cool yeah awesome well actually that is uh, thank you for an excellent interview i have actually run through my questions <laughs> awesome that's great no, this has been thank, fun. thank you so much for speaking with us man about the breach and everything um like I said, I'll I'll hit you some links and stuff. My review will be up soon, but it's it it it, it glows. It was definitely one of my favorites awesome. I've seen this year, and I've seen some pretty. There's been some pretty good ones this year so far too. So that's definitely saying something. Well, I really appreciate that, Stuart. That's that's an honor, and uh, it's it's awesome. Uh, I, I love hearing stuff like that. Obviously, you know, it's a filmmaker, but uh, I look forward to your review, man. And and uh, when this comes out, is this going to be like a a print thing or a, a uh it'll it we put it up on like our youtube channel and stuff like that okay so yeah okay, it, cool. it'll be out there on youtube and link through the website i'll hit you up though. definitely excellent excellent well thanks man thank you so much rodrigo you have a good one man it's good talking to you all right ciao take it easy yeah. bye